All right, there we go. Um, so my name is John Lepke. I'm from Listen to Disc Community Arts Organization. And I wanna start with our land acknowledgement because at Listen to Disc, we really wanna be mindful that um, we have a relationship to land and too often um, land acknowledgements in arts programming and, and accessibility programming and programming in general um, become something that you just do to do rather than doing something that um, ha you have a true relationship with. So we work, have a true relationship with that. So um, I'm reading off my phone because my computer is being a little bit grumpy. So forgive me, I don't have it memorized. Um, so we'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on traditional lands referred to as Treaty 4. So we're in Rajana, I myself am. Um, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, we respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and are committed to move forward in partnership with indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration and in line with the um, TRC. So um, also on behalf of Listen to Disc Community Arts Organization, we are Saskatchewan's only disability-led disability arts organization. Um, we'd like to acknowledge our members and our funders. Um, so we are glad to be supported by the Canada Council for the Arts, Creative Saskatchewan, Sask Arts, which is the new name for the Saskatchewan Arts Board, um, CIF or Community Initiatives Fund, City of Regina, Farm Credit Canada, and Affinity Credit Union. Truly, without you, there is no us. So we're gonna to start today. I'm just gonna make Shelby the host. Um, oops. <laughs> Here we go. There we go, Shelby, you are now the host. So Shelby will be working on our tech side so I can focus on dropping my headphones off of my head, apparently. That's what I can focus on. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm gonna uh, give a little bit of introduction to Derek Snow from No Dog Left Behind. Um, he's a certified dog trainer and has been since 2008. The published author of A Human's Guide to Surviving Puppy Puppyhood, um, something that uh, that can be a challenge. Lead trainer and founder of No Dog Left Behind Training and Behavioral Consulting Limited, um, a guest speaker uh, on Mix 103.9's Canine Connection, and a member of the Canadian Association of Service Dog Trainers. And I'm going to add personally. Uh, my household has a service dog um, and Derek is our wonderful trainer. So um, uh, Derek, did you want me to list off uh, the, um, the recap of the last session or did you want to kind of go through, go through that? I can, uh, well, thank you for the introduction, John. And I can take it from here and list off uh, a quick recap of the, for the viewers who missed the last call some of what we discussed. Now, the first thing being the differences between uh, emotional support animals, therapy dogs and service dogs. So just quick recap, an emotional support animal tends to just be something in Saskatchewan that is characterized as a dog that helps a person uh, feel better in numerous capacities, but has not received any formal training whatsoever. Uh, there's not much of a designation in Saskatchewan for an emotional support animal. So, uh, you know, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. Therapy dogs or therapy animals tend to be, um, let's say, dog in this circumstance where it's for other people. So like I could bring, uh, you know, if I had a registered therapy dog or certified therapy dog to a long term care facility, you know, pre COVID and so forth. Um, schools, airports, etc. any place um, where there's a lot of people and they would gain some positive uh, interaction from being around uh, a therapy dog. So it's more for other people. Where a service dog is specifically for its person, its handler uh, to mitigate a disability. Um, so 
a service dog to be qualified as one has to be specially trained and have services specific tasks that mitigate and or assist uh, someone's disability. So that's just a quick recap on of what we first discussed. The next was um, we talked a little bit about the Saskatchewan policy on service animals, where you can get a lot more information in detail of what types of service animals are, or dogs rather, there are, and a lot of other information. Uh, I don't know if Shelby's able to, but if someone could drop the link to that policy in the comments, that might be beneficial for um, some listeners. The next thing was how to, you know, get a service dog or potentially acquire one. And one option is owner trained where uh, a person trains their service dog themselves to pass, you know, testing, public access and mitigation task testing, whether they get the support of a trainer or they do it on their own. Another option is a program service dog where it is entirely trained by uh, institution or training business uh, and then placed with the recipient. Last thing, just quickly that we went over, was um, how I support uh, service dog teams. And primarily what I work with is owner trained teams, where I um, show them the processes and how to train their dog for the specific needs of the candidate, as well as we do offer program um, service dogs as well, where we fully train the service dog and implement it in for our, uh, our client. So that is the recap of it. What I want to move on to now is just introduce a special guest who was uh, kind enough to spend a little bit of time with us today in this during his, doing an interview. And it's Kyle Sarita, the chief of the Moostra and District Paramedic Service. If you could unmute yourself, my friend, and just say hello, and we can pick your brain. Good afternoon, everybody. My pleasure to be here. And thanks, Derek, for asking me to uh, participate. Happy to do so. Absolutely. Now, you might be wondering, hey, why do we have uh, this gentleman here from the Moose John District Paramedic Services? Well, it's for a very specific reason. Um, Kyle is with us today to share some of his experiences with um, his paramedic bases facility dog and training, Misty. So for uh, the first thing I just wanted to kind of ask you and we could discuss a little bit about is um, what led you and your team to consider acquiring a facility dog? I guess I, what I should mention to everyone first is what a facility dog is um, in a very like br nutshell kind of explanation. It's kind of like a therapy dog for a, a institution or um, a specific place so that the dog is there to facilitate and assist, um, you know, people, workers, students, et cetera, in that specific building. Uh, if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Kyle, you definitely can. That was a good recap of what I think we were looking for in relation to a facility, facility dog. Okay, great. So then for you, uh, the question being like, what led you and your team to consider even adding a, a facility dog as uh, is commonly aware now mental health and emergency services and beyond not simply in the professional world but in individuals personal lives um, mental health is extremely important and paramedics along with our allied agencies um, have the opportunity to do a lot of good and deliver services that uh, help protect individuals and specifically us in relation to their health. And while we get to do a lot of good, it is sprinkled with some tragedy that we can't avoid and unsee, and that can add a lot of stress to paramedics uh, on the street. So we've uh, continued to find ways to help address mental health in the workplace uh, for paramedics who are exposed to that. And we do have a lot of resources available to us and, and uh, not just peer-to-peer -peer or internet cognitive behavior programs. Um, when we considered looking at uh, different ways of delivering that, the concept of, of uh, an animal uh, initially, um, as we learned more and more as we went through this, we became much smarter and Derek helped us uh, understand the differences in relation to that. But we certainly 
saw firsthand how patients, um, um, the value that we saw with them who had service dogs. And certainly we deal with a lot of them when it comes to mental health or medical reasons, diabetes, seizures, all sorts of stuff. And then we started to see some service dogs incorporated with actual paramedics who um, are in service and practicing, as well as veterans, et cetera. So again, we saw some value there. So certainly when we look at, well, maybe there is some added benefit to having an animal within our organization as a whole that can help more than just one or two people, but everybody and what they do. So that was kind of the start of it. We saw a lot of value in the different uh, perspectives and started to flirt with, well, maybe there's something here for us. Right. Yeah, that's perfect. <clears throat> was there a specific event or circumstance that kind of tipped you from, you know, thinking about it being like, that'd be kind of be neat to being like, you know what, we should do this. <clears throat> we've, we've had a couple of events where we've had animals come in, but what we really started to notice is we have some satellite uh, facilities in, in how we deliver services and individuals were wanting to bring their animals to to where they live because they were away from home for periods of time and we certainly started to allow that um, because they were away from home and saw how important an animal was to them but then we learned that I think out of 30 paramedics 29 had an animal at home wow. uh, largely dogs uh, so clearly we're a dog family here uh, there's one outlier for a cat <laughs> Um, and a rabbit, I guess, was another person's. But we saw the connection uh, that an animal has and the importance it has to uh, individuals and paramedics to what it meant to them to connect with, with an animal, not just peer to peer, but certainly in their own little comfort of an animal. So uh, it, it really highlighted that, okay, you know, I have a dog myself and uh, uh, certainly it's important to me and, and bond with, with her. Uh, and really didn't put a lot of emphasis as to how much it means to have an animal um, at home, especially when I'm by myself, uh, to, to the stress and just um, having, having one uh, there uh, after a rough day or a traumatic event. So it's the staff learning more and more about the staff, which I didn't know all of them had animals. <laughs> not, a, right. not a job interview question we often uh, look for, but uh, really saw the value in it. And we had a few people who, who had lost their animals and, and saw how they uh, were impacted by it and, and not really often considered bereavement leave uh, for an animal, but uh, certainly that it's kind of an offset that we do now allow that because we saw such a connection with animals that, mm. that we just either didn't notice before or, or uh, take the time to realize. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. To move on, I'm wondering if, um, like, what Misty's primary role will be for you guys within your, you know, paramedic base to to work amongst um, staff mem members and so forth. To to accomplish two things: one, if there is a significant event, because we do um, debriefs, peer debriefs of uh, traumatic events for individuals, so. Uh, we have seen the value of that in the past. So we are hoping that Misty can, can, and can offer the same um, service, uh, but more consistently, because in the past we've had different animals. Uh, Misty being brought in as kind of a family member or, uh, or an employee or a canine paramedic, as we've sometimes uh, tagged her as, um, that consistency, uh, much like a consistent counselor who understands um, the environment, uh, we hope that will happen as well. Um, but obviously that doesn't happen every day. So we're looking for some of the presence that Misty might be able to help us within the facility, uh, either after hours or, or during the day. Because um, we saw again, it's that, uh, that tactile connection, that, that's that, that touch of the dog, um, having movement in the, in the lounge area, in the kitchen area, uh, and, and, you know, more so highlighted today with COVID, you know, allowed to hug anybody, touch anybody, do anything. So, you know, it's amazing how that kind of adds the uh, added um, uh, feeling when you get to, you know, pet a dog or rub its belly or, or just have some general fun with them to take your mind off the, 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 the call that you might have just come on or the 10 calls you just did in six hours to kind of give you that relief that's not work related. It's just a uh, uh, stress uh, reduction. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's incredibly powerful um, to provide access to uh, a sweet tool, not a, not a tool, of course, but like a sweet helper to assist and facilitate, um, you know, that stress reduction and, and, and bringing some enjoyment and, and fun into certain times that, you know, there might not be that. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention about Misty at all or um, that you wanted to share? I think just COVID has really highlighted, and I'm glad we started this journey pre-COVID, actually, that uh, we were considering it because COVID has really highlighted um, the challenges that we're facing even today with the added stress of what's happening, um, take away the, the connections that you have with other people, a simple handshake, uh, which I don't know if we'll ever get to do again in the next couple of years, but, but uh, certainly we can... Uh, um, uh, do hand, handshake tricks with our with Misty, uh, but it's the touch, it's the relaxation that uh, the the team can have when they come back into the facility after a couple calls or when they're eating their lunch or whatever it might be. Um, having an animal there like Misty, um, knowing that it's it doesn't belong to them, but uh, she's a team member with them, gives them a sense of pride, ownership, etc. That that uh, we're looking to just um, complement the services that we have. So um, Misty is going to be as much of one of the family as any one of our paramedics. Um, she'll obviously uh, be with us, um, or the handlers, myself and my wife, Angela, uh, uh, more predominantly after hours. But during the day, uh, we look forward to her incorporating um, much like a, a new employee would. For sure. So I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us. And I really think it's an amazing proactive uh, thing to do for, you know, um, your team members and so forth, uh, the addition of a facility dog. So um, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for you and your staff. So thank you again for coming on and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We've turned a few heads across the province and across the country in relation to paramedics and, and resources that are available in, uh, in a challenging job sometimes. So uh, we're happy to uh, uh, kind of set the trend a little bit to, uh, to that for, for paramedics, um, health and well-being. I was going to say, Kyle, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I was just wondering, are there other, and this is partially a Derek question as well, are there other um, paramedic uh I don't know why I said places, but um, other emergency services of your type that have a uh, facility dog at the moment that you know of? Well, I've been in Saskatchewan and none that we know across Canada that have reached out specifically. We've done a couple, um, uh, not media releases, but announcements, Twitter, social media and stuff as we have started to bring this deal on more and more. Um, and we've got a few responses and, all of them have been positive, but none that have identified that, hey, we're doing that too, um, that we're aware of. And certainly as a member and president of the College of Paramedics within Saskatchewan and uh, with the Paramedic Chiefs of Canada, um, those connections are pretty free flowing. So um, I hope there is because we're certainly seeing some benefit to uh, our efforts um, and the success that uh, we see our paramedics respond to uh, Misty's even short visits right now as she acclimates to us that uh, it, I, I wouldn't, I, I could see so much benefit from, from moving forward from other services. So I hope to see more. Mm -hmm. And Derek, how long has, like, when did, when did, uh, when did the department, like, when did the process begin and where are you at now? Kyle, I feel like it was 10 or so months ago. I might've been a bit longer than that, but we had, uh, uh, somewhere around that timeline. So Misty's planned on, uh, you know, getting implemented fully here in the next few months. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to add to that, Kyle, and, but. Before um, the world changed, but I want to say, yeah, December, January-ish, maybe. We were talking before, but certainly that formal um, process began somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah I, I, I had actually was doing some uh, exposure work with Misty at paramedic, <laughs> Moose Jaw Paramedic and EMS Services building 
And uh, it was a lot of fun because she made some really great progress and confidence. And I remember one situation specifically, Kyle, where we actually recorded it, but we were, I was trying to work on her confidence around unusual equipment. And she, we were all sitting around pre COVID, you know, um, in the, the garage with a handful of ambulances around and there's a, uh, a stretcher out there and I'm trying to get her to go on to it to build confidence. Um, and she's like, maybe, I don't know, 14 weeks or something like that. And we're like, come on girl. And we're, everyone's like cheering for her and she's really trying and she's jumping and she's not having success. And she goes down and she hesitates. She's like, I don't know. I'm like, come on girl, you can do it. And then she launches up and lands it and she's just perfect. And everyone likes clapping and laughing. Like it was, it was a really memorable, sweet moment, just like something so simple uh, as a dog jumping onto a stretcher, but it was a super cute puppy. And it was just such a, a energy flux change where it was like, it felt amazing to be part of that. And uh, I mean, I, I just shared it because it was a beautiful experience, but that really sticks out to me when we initially uh, kind of were hanging out at the base with her. In and out of the ambulance, like she owns them, front seat, back seat. Uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, it's quite funny how com confident and comfortable she feels, which is great. For sure. She does take a killer photo too. Like, uh, it's like driving, you got to get her to have her pause on the steering wheel. Like she's like, yeah, this is what I do. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us, Kyle. Thank you, Ender. Absolutely. Sounds good. All right, so we're gonna move to the uh, to the next part of this, which is um, Derek and I are gonna chat about uh, and ask questions about um, service dogs in the workplace, how to accommodate, things to think about, um, and also uh, appropriate conduct when you're around a service dog, and the the animal is working. Um, so why don't we start? Derek, with if you had to have a top three things that um, an employer should know when an employee is coming in with a service animal, what would you pick those to be? Uh, Full disclosure, so, I'm putting Derek a little bit on the spot here. So, can you repeat that question? Sure. Yeah. So, if if you uh, you know if if an employer comes to you, um, say I'm the employer, and I say, what are three things that I should know? because I know that I have an employee coming in with a service animal and I've never had that happen before. Okay, sure. Uh, the first thing would be to verify liability insurance um, to make sure that the business is covered as well as the service dog and handler. Uh, it's pretty important. Uh, typically, um, you know, depending on the situation, um, if the dog comes from an institution, uh, they tend to come with liability insurance, but sometimes owner train cases need to get their own private liability insurance, but just to make sure everything's kind of covered together. Another thing I would mention to an employer that is going to be, you know, onboarding a dog is just rest easy. Sometimes I think the fear of the unknown is very loud and powerful. And it's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? This dog is going to, you know, totally put our workplace upside down. And what if it poops and pees inside and it's going to bark at all the things and and I, I just want to take a moment that dogs who are service dogs that have been, you know, from an institution or certified <clears throat> from some entity uh, aren't going to do these things. They're very highly trained dogs and they're going to actually make off and often cases the workplace more productive, especially for their recipient, their handler, their team member. Um, the third thing I would be is just, uh, I would mention to an employer is just to take some time away before or during the uh, initial integration of the staff member to educate your other staff members of appropriate conduct, because that will save uh, a business um, a lot of time uh, managing their employees from potential disrup disruptions. Uh, but also it'll save the service dog team a lot of headache from people potentially doing um, poor etiquette wise service dog interactions. Um, so those would be my top three. Sure. Um, what are some of the things that you think uh, 
whether it's other employees or just, you know, um, folks in general need to know uh, about um, the proper etiquette when a service animal is around? Well, the biggest thing is, from what I hear from my clients uh, and my own circumstances with training uh, service dogs in public access situations is like, read the room. Like there's often times where service dog teams uh, almost get pummeled with attention from the public. I mean, I get it because the dog is super cute and interesting. Um, however, like this can happen three or four or five or six times per public outing for a service dog team. And, you know, depending on how a person is feeling, they might be open to some of it, all of it, none of it. So I think sometimes people just get caught so much in like, oh my gosh, it's such a pretty dog that they don't look at the person being like, uh, I'd like to leave, but I'm really polite. And I'll just let you talk about like past stories of your animal for the next 10 minutes while I feel uncomfortable inside. So that's the biggest thing I really, I guess, want to just impress is try to like, if you feel compelled to go and see a service dog team, which I kind of almost suggest you kind of just kind of smile and nod from what I hear from my clients, because they're just often busy just trying to live their lives like everyone else, but being repeatedly um, kind of interrupted from their daily lives. Uh, because they have a service animal and people are interested, which is why they got the animal so they could live their daily lives. So it's kind of a, an unfortunate circumstance at times. So that that's that's one thing. Okay. Uh, and some other things are like, etiquette wise is like, you might think that some of the things I'm going to share go without mentioning, but they don't because people do these things because I hear about these things and they happen to me in public sometimes with a dog. So if it seems a little like no, people wouldn't do that, yes, they will. So if you're one of those people, please don't. But like if you see a service animal public and it's vested and it does not say therapy dog, if it says therapy dog, you are probably invited to go and say, hi, how's it going? Nice dog. Can I pet it? And they're like, sure. But if it says service dog, it's like that dog doesn't exist. Like even as beautiful as it is, I mean, that's why I try to emphasize smile and nod. But like, for instance, like don't stare at the dog. Don't make prolonged eye contact and Google like, oh my gosh, it's the cutest thing. I mean, you don't want to disrupt what they're doing, which is really like facilitating uh, someone that has a disability with just them living their their day to day life. So it's 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 challenging, you know, um, Another thing being like, don't talk and make kissy sounds to the dog. Be like, hi, puppy. How are you? What's your name? It's like, that's disruptive to the dog and what they're doing. And it's not helpful, especially if this dog has to like pay attention to anything. But like, just for some examples, if someone's making kissy sounds when the dog should be like, do I smell your blood sugars off? You know, or the dog is sensitive to uh, variations of anxiety or uh, disassociation or whatever the circumstance. And they're like, oh, my person needs me to interrupt this. Um, like you're taking away from this person's welfare. I mean, I, I, I know people don't do these things on purpose. They're really just, it's innocent enough and they're, and they're trying to be kind and they're like, oh my gosh, you have a beautiful dog. But sometimes I think the easiest way to say it to really reinforce is you're taking away from the recipient's welfare by interrupting their dog's work. Can now, you speak to, oh, no, keep going. I got a bunch of other ones I could say, but you go okay. ahead. If you I know I was just, and we can come back to these for sure, but I was just wondering, you know, you spoke through, um, uh, you know, the making sure that you're not disrupting away from a dog who is tasking. Could you describe in, like in an employee um, or in a public place that people are likely to see what some of those taskings are that we're not used to seeing? I think often, um, people are used to seeing, uh, you know, a guide dog, um, but maybe they're not used to seeing, say, what a seizure alert dog is trained for or what a um, uh, diabetic alert dog or heart alert or, you know, um, even just physical support. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a great thing to bring up because since it's not statistical, like like the the, the examples you mentioned, people are kind of like, Oh, what's going on here? Why is this uh, person sitting on the ground and their dog is like heavily laying most of their body on the person's legs or chest? 
So that could be one, right? Like if someone's struggling through some, uh, you know, higher level emotional overload or is having a panic attack and needs some grounding assistance. I mean, you might see someone like sitting down on the ground with their service dog on them. And you're like, what's going on here? Not the time to ask, <laughs> just kind of glance and be like, okay, someone's getting some assistance. Walk on uh, because unintentionally a person is going to like a, a spectator is going to add another layer to what is already going on. So that could be like one example, right? Another one might be like tactile stimulation where the dog is just more like uh, kind of bugging almost what it looks like their um, handler or their partner, uh, you know, in the service dog team when they need uh, a kind of interruption. So for example, it could be like where someone isn't realizing, but they might be, you know, starting to get into an escalated state internally. And it's just kind of getting worse and worse and thoughts are ruminating and cycling. And they're not, they might be disassociated for a few moments where they're there, but not really there. Um, and the dog can recognize like, you haven't moved in a bit. You're not acting the way you normally do. And then they come in and they like, jump on put their paws on their shoulders and lick the person's face and you're like oh that's super cute how nice what a sweet dog you have i'd like my dog to do that well it's like this person is actually going through something physiologically and internally could you just give them a step and let them kind of collect themselves and once again i want to reinforce of course people don't realize um, some of these things that are happening so they're very coming on it very honestly of being like oh that's interesting but to try to help educate to some extent it's kind of like if you see a service dog doing anything with their handler, basically that's the thing of just move on, you know, kind of take a glance if you, if you find yourself doing so, but continue on because um, like that person's really dealing with some things uh, like tasking can vary to a whole bunch of different things. It might be like where, you know, a dog's ringing a bell and you're like, what's the dog doing ringing this bell? It's weird. It's like, well, maybe it's a medication alert and the person is alerted at certain times to take certain medications. Um, it could be mobility, right? Where, um, you, you know, someone is putting some weight on a dog's uh, harness and the dog's helping them up some stairs, uh, things of that nature. That's about all I can think of right on this moment, John, but I hope that answers the query. Absolutely. Uh, I muted myself not to distract and then manage to not unmute, so that was not very smart of me. Um, yeah, so you, you were talking a little bit about, um, you know, other examples of distraction. What are some examples, I can think of one, um, where there's information floating around around service dogs that there might be a grain of truth, but it's not particularly accurate, you know, on social media and things. Um, for example, uh, you know, I've seen lots of sort of um, viral posts about if a service dog run up, runs up to you and starts barking, follow it when realistically, most of the time in my experience, the service animal is trained to stay with the handler. Um, you know, what are some, what are some information about service dogs that you sometimes have to dispel? Um, well, yeah. So I, the, the, honestly, the first thing that came to mind when you were bringing up that question was like a service dog registry. You know, because you can quite easily go online uh, and, you know, Canadian service dog registry or something or American or whatever, and you can literally print off a certification on your computer, but it's not valid. And that's, I guess, one thing to bring up is sometimes people are like, you know what, I have a service dog. I trained it myself. It's really good. What do I do? And then they Google it and then they use, um, you know, a a registry online that seems legit and it asks like 10 questions and they're like okay ding 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 you're good and then they print it off and put it on their dog so like something like that it's it's the ruling and the legislation is a bit more ambiguous in saskatchewan so like <clears throat> that wouldn't necessarily qualify as a service dog you i would definitely reach out to saskatchewan human rights to verify this because i am not a representative of them um, but with saying that the tendency is in our province that the team, the service dog team would have had to had specific training, typically with, uh, a recognized trainer, uh, within the region to, um, help assist them through the process and to some form of a certification. So 
from you mentioning that, uh, that was the first thing that came to mind was the service dog registry uh, doesn't really mean anything. And how many, uh, including yourself, uh, service trainers, do we have uh, ish? Because um, I'm springing the question on you, but uh, in Saskatchewan right now, who would fit under that sort of um, certified or uh, uh, understood as professional trainer? I don't know. I can speculate, but it would be Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission that would have somewhat of an idea on that. But I would go out on a limb and say anywhere from maybe three to 10. Um, but it's a pretty open number. I, I just don't know. That's that's fair enough. And can you um, can you speak a little bit? Um, and perhaps you did in the first session, but even if you did, I think it bears repeating about the training that you had to do to get to that point. Um, so like a lot of it was spending time working with, um, uh, Citadel Canine Society. So Citadel Canine Society is a nonprofit organization that has trainers across the country that provide at no cost to the recipient, um, typically psychiatric service dogs, more specifically post-traumatic stress assistance dogs. So uh, I think six or seven years ago, they had reached out to me specifically because they had a recipient that was looking for a trainer in their region. And I had worked with this gentleman before. And I think I had mentioned this on the last call, but that's pretty much how it began. And I received some training from Citadel Canine Society, um, as well as like the, the industry is vast. And depending on what portion of service dogs you're working with, um, like realistically, there's not a lot of training out there for service dog trainers. Um, so some of it is just ensuring you are passing, uh, and you've taught the dog to pass government legislation. Like for instance, like the British Columbia and Alberta, um, qualification assessments is what it's called in Alberta for service dog certification, using that as like a, a, a criteria to meet as well as training the mitigation tasks or service specific tasks. So since tasks can vary widely, I mean, you could, there's up to like 30 some tasks a dog could be trained for, for psychiatric services alone. Um, you know, no one taught me how to do every one of them. Some of it was just using my, you know, uh, 15 years of understanding of dog behavior and how we need the dog to do specific things to um, reverse engineer what the dog needs to do for the person. And, you know, it's worked really well. Um, so a lot of it was reps, to be quite frank. Fair enough. Um, within those, within those sort of 30 tasks, you know, how many, um, you know, that I know the answer to this, but for everybody else, how many um, tasks are you typically training uh, a psychiatric service dog to undertake? Sure. So it's anywhere from kind of three to five to eight, you know, it kind of varies, but like, for example, for certain service dog certification certification tests, it's like a minimum of three to be, you know, considered, uh, you know, a service dog where the service dog mitigates, uh, someone's disability. Sure. Let's pause for a second. Um, and if anybody has any questions, uh, they can put them in chat. There is or one that I similar. see in the chat. Um, it looks like from Priscilla. I don't know if you want me to read it out loud or if you want to. or Yeah, sure. You can read it out loud. Okay. If we use a service dog to be socialization bridge for autistic kid, can we opt to train the dog to be a therapy animal instead of a service animal? I, uh, I already have bought a puppy. So we have a puppy from Echo, Labradors from Borden. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not very sure how I want it. My son is three years old. Uh, we want the animal to be like a, a socialization bridge so people would come over and talk to him and he won't be like lost in his own little world. Uh, we spoke to MSAR in Manitoba and we've spoken to some more people as well. But we're just thinking if we just need to train the dog to be a therapy dog or to be a service animal, we... We don't know how to make that decision. Um, I'm a little confused here. 
Sure. I mean, I can definitely uh, have you think about some things. So a lot of it comes down to when and where you want the dog to be a bridge, uh, you know, for social interaction and so forth for your child. If it's primarily at, uh, you know, just wherever you guys go, um, like for a walk or any somewhere outside, I mean, you could just have a therapy dog, but if you need this dog to be this bridge in public access situations, you would need a, a service dog typically because a therapy dog can only really be in a public access situation if it's uh, been okayed by whatever facility it's going on, going to rather. Whereas like uh, uh, the a service dog is, I don't know, I don't want to say allowed, but the person with the disability has access rights to go wherever a public access place is. And if they have a medical tool, which I mean, a dog is not a traditional medical tool, but it kind of falls under that same type of criteria is that person can bring that entity with them. I, I hope that offers some yes. insight. Does it make uh, sense? Yes, we were thinking of school, like not every day, but at least uh, sometimes to school when he goes to school, uh, like I don't want him to be left out. Um, I want people to come, kids to come over and speak to him. I don't want him to be that lonely kid. So um, that's what I'm really concerned about. It's more of an all or nothing kind of situation. Uh, it's just kind of the reality of it is like the dog consistently goes with the child to places like that um, okay. or it doesn't okay. because it's a fairly large undertaking to get your dog to a position of, you know, service dog status for your child. Mm -hmm. um, that once you kind of cross that bridge and if you were to get to that space, um, the, you would presumably use that asset to, you know, your best ability to maximize the results. But things get more tricky when it's with children because there's uh, some considerations as far as depending on you know what is going on with the child is like there can be hesitation to wait until the child is older um so the dog the child does not get entirely reliant on a service animal from early on yeah um, that's the i mean it's really a discussion to have with you know um a psychiatrist or a psychologist or someone a doctor who would prescribe um or suggest, you know, a service animal, they would be able to your, you know, your medical team would be able to give you better insight on on that part, because I just don't have those answers. But I think that this will give you a few more things to consider. Yeah, sure. I have one last question. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, for, for an ADHD, for an adult with ADHD, if we have to train a dog to like be with him the whole time, or just to be a good companion, like a therapist, I don't know if I'm using the right word, like a therapy dog. What kind of training uh, is it? Is it similar training to an autism service dog or an ADD therapy dog just needs basic obedience training? It Where comes it down to public access. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want the dog to facilitate and make someone feel better in their home or outside um, or a place where dogs are allowed to be, then you're looking more at like an emotional support animal. Mm -hmm. A therapy dog is more for like other people where emotional support animals for the, the person, but there's not necessarily any specific training that had to be done beyond, you know, basic training skills. So the dog isn't disruptive. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Eric, can I ask you a follow-up question just to run the support for, um, uh, for an autistic person? What are some of the, um, some of the tasks that uh, you would be, you would, I mean, I know it's down to the client, right? And the handler, but what are some, some typical tasks that uh, a service dog might, um, might do for somebody with autism? It varies drastically, but like uh, it can vary depending whether the person, um, and the, t the person with autism is younger or older, an adult, you know, et cetera. Um, so I don't have much experience with placing service dogs with um, like autistic assistance service dogs with children. 
but I do with adults. Um, so some of their tasking can vary, uh, but is similar in certain cases to uh, general psychiatric service dog training, you know, um, medication alert reminders, uh, tactile stimulation where the dog disrupts an, an emotional overload, um, deep pressure therapy, things of that nature. Um, the list could go on, but that's what comes to mind to begin with. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, for sure. Does anybody else have any questions at this point? While we're figuring that out, I'm going to bring in a dog that you may or may not be able to see because she is black and my shirt is black. But in case someone wants to see a dog face instead of my mug constantly, I thought I'd give a little uh, change sure. of uh, stimulus, a little pattern interrupt. There you uh, go. Come here, girl. Come up here. Come on. You don't feel well. There you go. So you can't really see her very well, I don't think, because <laughs> she's black. <laughs> but she's got these really gray eyebrows on her little face right here. Oh, there we oh, go. There you go. We can kind of see, but she's uh, she's a snuggler. And this one is living with me for uh, service dog training. So she is uh, got big, big things coming for her. And what is she being trained to uh, task for? It's really actually going to be for, um, oh gosh, I'm having a mental block here. Um, Tourette's assistance um so like interrupting certain types of ticks um things of that nature and support in general grounding grounding can be a big one depending on um an individual's challenges with ticks and um like i've actually the recipient of her my other dog fergus spends a lot of time with while she's being trained and grounding is a big one where something as simple as, um, you know, the dog sitting on the person's feet while they brush their teeth can minimize the like ticks like this. So obviously you, you wouldn't think of it, but if you're brushing your teeth and you have a like fairly rapid, intense tick, uh, it can really quite negatively impact you. But with, uh, you know, a dog grounding, just being touching your feet and the back of your legs or laying on feet, it can like reduce the frequency frequency of that happening. There's actually a, a story. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay. My yeah. mic was really far away. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. You're good. There was, uh, there's already been some amazing things that my dog has done for this individual. Um, just in tur in on the interim while she is getting trained um, that I like I have no idea how anyone else could do because um, sometimes uh, the recipient will get into more consistent like scratching ticks where it's like scratching a, a piece of skin and it for whatever reason any human that tries to disrupt or interrupt these um, it actually can you know not help whatsoever or even make it worse but there was one time where my dog Fergus went and began to like lick the place where the person was scratching and and just like what are you doing i don't understand like that's my dog's mm -hmm. perspective basically and then within like 30 seconds um you know the individual was laughing and giggling and my dog was licking him everywhere and stuffing his face into him and totally kind of snapped the person out of that situation that could have like lasted for 30 minutes and ended with like some marks and 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 um lesions and so forth instead mm -hmm. of it being done in 30 seconds and totally flipping the script and it's just spectacular and amazing how um you know some dogs can be so intuitive because we didn't teach him to do that my my dog um but at that point he was just kind of more emotional support kind of um spending some time and uh to, you know for him to do that on his own um it was beautiful mm -hmm. so for the um for the dog that you're, I don't know how many uh, you're currently training as sort of like a, a program dog, if we wanted to call it that. Um, but what is your standard? I know, I know this varies tremendously, but in your experience, say, you know, I want to go and, and get a puppy tomorrow <laughs> and, and um, 
hire you for for training what what would be your average wait time uh before you that dog is say um with the person consistently yeah well and this is where it's really hard right because often when people are reaching out they like would like or need support right away and the process can you know be a year and a half to two years or and that's just if you have the dog in your hands um so if um, someone comes to me being like you know what i need like a certain type of breed of dog for size and mobility or whatever the circumstance is and i'm like okay you know we can discuss that but it might take me six months to acquire that dog you know at eight weeks or seven weeks old so then I have to add that six months on to potentially two years. So, you know, it could take between two to three years to get, uh, you know, to find someone to assist you and to get the dog into your home. Um, it's just because the process is, is vast and it's complicated and there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what do you, um, what do you look for when you're going to, uh, you're going to look for that, um, uh, I don't know what the what the term is the um, the candidate dog. Yeah, so once again, it it varies. So, for instance, with if I'm looking for like a psychiatric service dog prospect, um, let's say for post traumatic stress, um, I'm really looking for certain puppies that more move towards energy. Uh, influxes versus are indifferent or move away. Like that's one of the, I, I would could categorize it as empathy. I, I can't for sure say that it's empathy, but it seems like it where it's almost like the dog recognizes, oh my gosh, something's not right. You don't seem like, you know, you're feeling good. I should come and fix you. And then they get up and run over and this is a puppy and it starts licking the person's face. Um, so like that is high on the list. Um, for instance, like then this happened to me when I was training uh, po a post-traumatic stress assistance dog, um, where I had acquired this dog as an, as an adult and I was going through some things with my son and I broke down and I was lying on the ground crying, to be honest with you. And the dog was upstairs and ran downstairs and laid beside me. This is a dog I'm training for someone else. And he started licking the tears off of my face and he was just nestled right into me and like, boom within like a minute or two i was like oh i started like almost crying for a different reason right i'm like you're the sweetest guy ever thank you i needed that <clears throat> so it's that is a big one uh through you know the past seven years of working with service dogs that is i've really been drawn to is kind of like the empathy because not every dog will want to run towards you know higher levels of intensity uh, whether it be like higher vocalizations of frustration or fear or, you know, loudness or moving fast um, or crying for that matter. Some dogs will go away from it. They're like, okay, you know, something's wrong with you. I'm out of here. So I really like those ones. And obviously temperament of like this dog loves people and I need to teach them to like kind of be a bit more neutral. I don't want dogs who are standoffish with people. Um, because it's a public health risk. So I really want to ensure that the dogs are like, oh my God, people are the best. And I'm just kind of like, okay, the people are awesome, but focus on this one um, because then you can save yourself a lot of uh, work. So those are the biggest kind of handful uh, without getting into too much detail is sure. moving towards energy. Um, you know, a really solid, like sweet temperament of like, I love everybody, those kinds of things. Perfect. This one's getting hot sitting on my lap. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, I thought maybe we could go back to, to sort of uh, not quite where we started, but we were talking about, um, uh, you know, workplaces and things like that. Um, so I just wanted to go back there for a second. So Can we go to the etiquette. Yeah, sure. Can apply to workplaces and in public. Absolutely. Let's go back to etiquette. Yeah, so same goes whether I see a service dog in public, whether it's in training or it's already done its training, or I see this dog in a work situation um, to, to be mindful and respect, respectful of the team. So another thing uh, I don't think I had mentioned yet was sneak attack pets. These ones are notorious. I mean, it surprises me sometimes. I'll be sitting there with a client or myself 
with a dog on a bus or something like that. And the dog's tucked away under the seat or sitting close beside. And then all of a sudden someone will be looking beside and like, Ooh, you can see their like thoughts going and stewing and their eyes get a little bit bigger. And then they start like leaning in to touch the dog. And then part of me wants to go like that. I haven't, but just as a silly side note, but it's like, no, don't, you don't pet someone else's service dog. Like keep your hands to yourself. I know it's cute and it's cuddly, but it's not there for your enjoyment and entertainment. So please be respectful of the team. Cause once again, uh, you could unintentionally be disrupting this dog from focusing on the wellness of its candidate or its team member rather. So please don't touch a service dog ever without asking first. And this is another big step is if the, the handler denies you to touch their service dog, smile and say, oh, no worries and walk away. Do not please put more stress on that individual by trying to make them feel bad that they didn't indulge your interest of touching their service animal that's on duty. Um, do you have anything you want to mention to add? To yeah, that I was going to, I was going to add one because I have noticed, um, uh, as, as somebody who's has a partner with a service dog, who's still, by the way, staring at the door, wondering when she's going to come back, yeah. uh, cause it's too cold for where she's going today. Um, uh, you know, one thing that I've seen happen a lot is people sneaking photos oh, of service yes. dog teams or, um, so oftentimes, uh, a lot of folks trained by, by Derek actually, but, uh, you know, occasionally service dog teams will meet up, uh, when it's not COVID, <laughs> um, and you get this thing where, you know, I get the impulse to want to take a photo when there are a bunch of service animals together. Uh, but I see it a lot also when it's just, uh, my wife and I walking around because well, they also often, I use a wheelchair. They often presume that um, the dog is mine, yeah. <laughs> even though for, for pulling me around in my chair. Never mind that he's a Shih Tzu Schnauzer and is about 18 pounds soaking wet. Um, okay. He's capable if you wanted to. But um, yeah, that's the, that's the only thing that I would, um, that I would add. Um, I have some what, more too. Okay, go for it. Um, the photo one is a good one, obviously. Um, like I wouldn't just take a picture of someone walking by at superstore that I thought was, you know, interesting or good looking or whatever, right. That would be socially inappropriate. It's no different to me, take a picture of someone and their animal. So please do not do that. Um, then another one was, um, service dogs come in all shapes, sizes, colors. So sometimes certain types of service dogs, which I'm sure someone on this call can identify with, will garner a lot more attention because they're not a black lab or something or a yellow lab, whatever. But like you can have a service dog that's this big or you can have a Great Dane. So even if they are just different than your expectations were or potentially like, oh, that's an interesting you know, service dog, I get that it's the curiosity peaks, but you still treat that team with the same amount of uh, kindness and consideration as you would a team that had a black lab that you're like, well, that looks like a service dog. So that's probably, you know, I'll probably just leave them alone. Uh, always look if someone's in public and it's not like a pet friendly place, probably a service dog. Um, so I would definitely try to be considerate of, you know, their life and, and what's going on with them. I feel like I have another one or two here, just a second. No problem. I, just while you're just while you're thinking through that, the uh, mm. so often it's it's the I find it's and this is around access needs for me, not necessarily a service dog. It's so much easier when people um, it's it's the secretive ones that are the most frustrating. Uh, mm. You know, it's it's actually oftentimes lot easier when somebody comes to talk to you as long as it's not like tasking is happening or i'm in my case trying to get my wheelchair out of a car <laughs> but um it's the sneaky ones or the like um the the posts on social media where we had one where somebody posted a picture on social media and was complaining that we had our dog in a public place and it was just because the vest was um the the uh it was it was in his vest but the the first vest that he had where the 
um, mm. the logo wasn't the most visible thing in the world. Um, and, and you just, you end up in this big defensive um, moment when really if that person had taken a second to realize, as you said, the dog is in public, he is wearing some kind of vest and that person is, you know, he's, he's walking to heel and doing all of those things that, that that's a, that's a learning for sure. What were some of the other ones you said you had a couple that you'd. Um, well, one is like the thing that comes to mind is like, um, being an, uh, another customer of the same store or being in the same facility as someone is um, to just be respectful of people's privacy and to not ask them what the service dog is for. Not everybody wants to, you know, share, you know, medical history with someone they don't know. Um, and it's just for whatever reason, since it's relating to a dog, I feel like some people are more be like, Hey, what's it? What, what do you got a service dog for? Like, what's wrong with you? And it's like, that's not a nice thing to say. And I, it would be nice if you didn't, um, one, phrase it that way, and two, probably ask at all, because uh, it, it's just like, I don't know how else to, like, it's just not their business. Mm -hmm. um, so just to be respectful of people's privacy, because um, I don't think if someone with a service dog turned it around on that person, be like, you know what, let, tell me some of your medical history, uh, that you'd be like, oh, sure. Like, it, some people would, of course, but just to, um, you know, try to be once again, considerate of the team and be like, you know what, like, I'm really curious and uh, I'd like to know some more, but uh, to know some boundaries, um, mm -hmm. because typically someone who is willing to share facts like that, will share them voluntarily without prompt. Mm -hmm. I had one more that came to mind, uh, which is when, um, you know, you said people will talk about, you know, I like puppies too. So often, uh, especially, uh, and uh, the one we have does have a patch that says psychiatric service dog, but often you'll get people who want to share their traumatic experiences mm. with their dog. Right. And that's just oftentimes not something that's super um, easy to emotionally manage when everybody yeah. wants to talk about their own bereavement and like totally understand, but it's kind of the time and place thing, right? Like I actually had another one of my clients mention that exact same thing that you just brought up that I'm like, really, this happens because it hasn't happened to me yet. But it's like people are bringing up like past, like passed away past dog stories about, you know, how their dog impacted them positively. And, and I, I know it's a really genuine kind place that they're coming from and empathizing with, but sometimes, especially if you have a psychiatric service animal, that energy might be difficult to process. And if it happens a few times a day, like my five coins have just turned into one and I'm like uh, ready to get out of public because I'm tapped out. Yeah. You never know what the trigger of the other person is going to be. <laughs> um, sure. Can I, can I ask a question that just popped up? Cause it happens sometimes in my life. And I think it might be interesting sure. for those that are listening. What would your suggestion be when um, interaction with a service animal is sort of unavoidable? And, and I mean that like, um, I've had it happen a number of times and I know how I've managed it where, you know, the dog is, um, the dog is vested, but is not, um, like you're down to eat or something. They're not, they're not really, not that they're not paying attention, but they're not, you know, they're not active and walking around and they'll rest their head in my wheel or something. And then the person can't see it. Uh, the, the, um, the handler can't see it or doesn't notice. Um, you know, what would your suggestion be when, uh, when those kinds of inadvertent, um, you know, I, I, I need to move this dog or I need to, um, you know, do no, I get, I get where you're coming from. Actually a specific circumstance comes to mind where I was sitting at, uh, a restaurant with a client of mine and their dog, and we were having a meal catching up on some things and the service dog came and like sh the dog was in a down stay but like kind of broke the down stay for a moment and was like kind of sniffing my hands and nudging them and all I did in that moment was I did I want to pet the dog yeah for sure I did my life is around dogs I like petting dogs <laughs> but out of respect for um, the team and the handler I'm like you know what I mentioned the person's name I'm like just as a heads up you know, your dog is um, on my side, if in the event that you wanted to replace her, if you don't, it's totally fine. Um, just let me know if you mind if I pet her or not. So it's, it's just asking, 
you know, ask and give that respect and consideration. I, consideration is the word of the day. I yes, guess. perfect. I'll, I'll refrain from impersonating Elmo. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions that they wanted to bring forward? Um, we'll just give it maybe a minute for that because I know some people might want to type in the chat. It looks like um, Angela might have unmuted herself. Sorry, I think I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, okay. yeah, that's okay. Um, we were just wondering if Pomeranians would make a decent service dog or not. Or the biggest question is for what? Without you know telling me medical history, um, out of respect for you guys, but like, uh, it, it's variable. It depends, right? Like, so if someone needs some like more like physical tactile stimulation or um, deep pressure therapy, you know, the dog might not physically be enough. Uh, I'm not saying that's the case, I have no idea, but can you give me a uh, like general like phrase, like, you know, psychiatric service animal, mobility service animal or something so I can kind of somewhat understand for well, what? Well, I guess um, <laughs> um, possibly for, um... It might be for psychiatric, I don't know, like anxiety issues or um, like autism as well. Like there's, I guess, a few different issues in our household, but PTSD would be another one. Well, the, the other thing being is, is the dog for one person or a few? Um, primarily one, I guess, but possibly a few. Okay. So w if it was for one, um, typically I would look more at like emotional support. If you wanted the dog to like facilitate, you know, uh, a, a few family members um, yeah. and assist them, but I, it's relative. Like um, as far as small breed dogs go with um, public access situations, you just have to have different considerations. Like John would have an idea of this. For instance, one example might be like, you have to be very cautious of, um, people in shopping carts uh, because they might take out your dog because they might not oh. be paying attention or um, you know they but on the on the positive note they can fit anywhere you know you can put the dog in your lap or if you wanted to have them under uh, you know a bus seat or something like that if you're in public transportation yeah. um, so it's really just trying to outweigh the positives versus you know some of the challenges and what you're really doing if you feel some connection to the breed um, or physical characteristics, I would try to take that a little bit out of the equation and be like this type of dog and the ones I've met, uh, do they have what it takes to perform the certification, um, test, uh, yeah. to pass it along with which tasks do I want? So that's what the biggest things I am thinking about. Cause I don't really look at breed, uh, okay. as I mean, I do of course, but it's more at like temperament. Uh, what do you need the dog for? And like, as far as like, can it, does it going to have the aptitude to learn all these things that they need to know to pass a certification test? Are they social enough, uh, but not too social? And uh, the tasks that you want to teach them, are they capable of physically doing it? Okay. What are some that of those sort of, oh, sorry. You go ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say, um, what are some, uh, if you could, some, uh, yeah, I know I've been sitting at the door for a while. Um, what are some, uh, if we wanted to call them non-standard breeds, which I guess what I'm saying is like, take away the German Shepherds and the, um, the, um, the Golden and Black Labs for a second. What are some non-standard breeds that you sort of gravitate towards? when you're looking at, let's say, just because of the example that Angela brought up, psychiatric service animals? Um, well, what anything, really. Um, some ones that I gravitate towards are really well-bred, like um, Bernadoodles. I mean, sometimes people are not fans of the doodles. Uh, because of uh, breeding and some genetic deficiencies, but there are really well-bred ones. And like, for instance, she's a um, golden mountain doodle, which is like a poodle, um, golden retriever and Bernese mountain dog, but in really considerate concentrations and pieces. And she is like the sweetest thing ever. And uh, one of my clients, uh, 
um, you know, service dogs in training. And like, I like her a lot because she's lower shedding. Uh, her dander isn't as affecting to people who have allergies. Um, so she's just like for this situation and specifically, she's a really good suit for where she's going. But once again, it's all relative to um, what someone wants and needs, because if for whatever reason, a person is really drawn to a smaller breed animal that really might bring them more comfort um, and help them work through some things better than any other breed, then I'm like, fair enough, let's find a small breed dog that, you know, fits, checks all the boxes. Yeah. Like I can say, um, just sort of anecdotally, if it helps that, uh, you know, our, uh, service dog in this house is a Shih Tzu Schnauzer cross. Um, and, uh, that's a lot of the reason why we decided to train him was partially what Derek mentioned earlier about like naturally intuiting, um, uh, tasks to do you know we've been talking about possibly getting a service dog and then we looked and we're like well that one's already kind of doing it so why don't we see what happens there but also mm -hmm. because neither my wife or I drive so it was also a priority of like having an animal that's easy to take on the bus and easy to get into smaller situations and um, easier to fit into office scenarios and those sorts of things For while sure. still being the 18 to 20 pounds capable of doing things like pressure therapy effectively. Yeah, exactly. And like you raise a good point in the capacity of like, like if depending on what a person's lifestyle looks, if they're like in public transportation a lot or want to fly a lot or are in a smaller portion proportioned areas, it's like, well, you might not want like a Mastiff as a service animal or like a Great Dane because they're not going to fit good in beside you in a, you know, a plane or on the bus, they're going to take up a lot of space. So it's not to say you couldn't do it. Uh, it's just that, you know, it's like give and take. Uh, Angela, one other you, thing. Oh, I was just going to ask Angela if you had any, uh, any follow-ups you wanted to ask or um, anything like that. And you're muted just in case you don't know. Um, I have a question. Okay, I'm going to assume Angela is... Uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't yeah. have another okay. question. Perfect. Thanks, Angela. Go ahead, Prisa. Uh Okay, so um, you had said that one dog can help uh, two family members. Is that right? I thought like one dog was only meant for one person. Depends what it is, right? If it's a service dog, I'm not going to want to have a service dog, uh, you know, tasking for two separate people. But if it was like an emotional support, you know, quote unquote, uh, a companion animal that made different people feel good. I mean, it can, it'd be, it could do that with numerous people. Does that make more sense? Yes. Yeah. Because like both the adult with ADHD and uh, the kid with autism both need help with like deep pressure sometimes and also you you spoke I think you said tactile like when they get lost in their own world it just comes in disrupts them and says hey and brings them back so they both need help with that so like since I already have the puppy here if I if I ask a trainer to just um, train like if I just have this puppy as an emotional support animal and ask the trainer to only train these two areas is that possible or should the puppy go through the whole training? Well, that's a discussion to have with your trainer. Uh, I don't know what they're going to want to do or what they would suggest. If it was me, um, it would more or less be like your dog has to go through some basic training. So it is a, you know, a good dog without any behavioral issues um, and adequately socialized and knows how to do a handful of things so that when yeah. it, you need it to task, it will, but it's equivalent of like, I don't use the phrase emotional support animal a lot because it doesn't really mean anything here, but I'll use it in this circumstance because it's basically a dog that lives within your home that does not have public access and hasn't necessarily received tons of specific disability training. Yeah. But um, you can have a companion animal that has been taught some service specific tasks to mitigate people's, you know, reactions or discomfort or, or difficult uh, scenarios. So that would be um, basically 
kind of what it sounds like you might be looking for is a companion dog with some kind of uh, mitigation task uh, abilities for them. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Derek. One thing that I noticed we didn't talk about particularly is um, the the tasks that some dogs do that is um, like their genetics allow it. So I'm thinking like, um, uh, as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, things like, um, uh, sorry, heart, uh, 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 diabetic alerts, and um, um, some of those tasks that, uh, that are, um, I remember you saying either do it or you don't. Can you explain what some of those are? Well, I might just change the phrasing a little bit. Sure, go ahead. You're the trainer. A bit more like an innate kind of knowledge of how to recognize something versus genetic because sure. that kind of alludes to the fact that you could breed these dogs and consistently get like a certain result, which that makes sense. there's not necessarily the evidence to show. Um, but like some dogs will innately and intuitively be able to recognize when their team member, you know, has... Um, low blood sugar and will offer them some kind of a prompt that takes years for the person to be like, Oh my gosh, is it my blood pressure? Oh, my, or not blood pressure, but uh, blood sugar. And then they clue in like the dog's been telling them for five years that their blood sugar is low. So yeah, it does happen. Um, other ones are like, uh, under, like I know a few cases where dogs will predict oncoming, uh, like migraines like bad migraines, like 10, 15 minutes in advance of being like, oh, hey, human, you should chill out because something's coming that's going to disrupt you. And by their behavior acting unusual. And after some repetition, the person's like, oh my gosh, like six times in a row, I just realized that my dog was barking in my face. Doesn't ever do it except when like 10 minutes later, this migraine's coming on. I thought I was getting the migraine from the dog because it's barking in my face. <laughs> Um, but stuff like that does happen. And I have come across it a handful of times, uh, where it wasn't anything to do with me. It's just the dog came, um, and for this person, for whatever reason, it knew something was off with the person and that they needed to like, know. and it, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And, uh, lots of times we, I suspect it's scent related for them to kind of uh, be like, oh, you smell off, something is coming, because I know when I smelt this before, then you had fill in the blank. Um, but I, you know, it's dependent, I can't verify that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are often the videos that you see on social media, I think of the, um, particularly epilepsy support, where, you know, they're there at the gym or something, and the dog is petting them saying, go lie down, because you're, you know, you're, you're about to have one. Yeah, like so some of that stuff can absolutely be trained. Um, some of it is more difficult. But like I said, there's so many different kinds of service dogs that it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it takes some time to delve into what is innate and what can be taught and etc. Yeah, it's sort of like asking which, which, which car is the best for your particular situation. Yeah, no, but without saying particular situation, it's like, what car is the best? Well, tell me some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Um, do we have any other additional questions? Um, and interpreters, if you have one, you can as well. That's totally fine. Uh, all right, before we close, I, maybe we could bump back if you're comfortable, Derek, to the, uh, um, to the workplace environment. So let's take um, let's take an office scenario because it seems to be the most generic. What uh, what are some things that you would um, if you were walking with your with the handler and you're going to um, scout out the place with them before they go in for their first day of work? What are some things that you'd be pointing out? Uh, I think this is valuable both for handlers but also um, you know. Uh, bosses or employees that might be thinking in those terms yeah so once again it's relative to the type of service animal you have and for what um, but the first thing that would come to mind would just be like um well where are you where's your primary workspace 
if it varies, do you have a place where the dog can safely be, uh, you know, lying on a mat or near you without being disruptive to others or uh, potentially getting stepped on, uh, things of that nature. So if, and if it's an office setting, I mean, it's a lot easier because if you had like a cubicle per se, um, and a desk, you know, you have a dog bed under your desk and the dog lays there unless, you know, you need it to do something else. So it's a little bit more simpler, but if you're like working at a manufacturing facility, well, then there's like a lot more to consider. And I don't know the circumstances of, uh, what it would look like to facilitate that safely. Um, so biggest thing is just trying to make sure the environment is both safe for the dog, but also for the other staff, uh, in the sense of obviously like kind of inquiring if, um, any staff members have severe allergies, right. Cause there might have to be an accommodation made where the dog is in a different floor or a different side of the room, or, um, you know, depending on the type of dander and size of the dog and the severity of the allergy, uh, to make sure that, um, everything goes okay for all parties. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at sort of, uh, um, like not necessarily just this, but like return to work scenarios. I know psychiatric service dogs in their various permutations have come up a number of times today. Um, you know, what are some of those things that, uh, that you see often being worked through when somebody's going from, you know, prior to this inciting incident of needing to get a service dog, I didn't have these considerations through to, um, we've already spoken about a lot of them, uh, liability insurance, um, the physical space. Uh, but what are some of the things that you have to support teams with that are more, um, does it make sense if I say more thinking related? Like more approach um, related? I'm not really sure what you're asking uh, as far as sure. like reintegrating, let's say a, a staff member went off and then it's coming back on duty with the service animal. Is that kind of what you mm -hmm. mean? I just mean sort of, yeah, I sort of mixed two questions together. So apologies. But I just mean, what are some of the things that you, you, um, you get service handlers to think through as you're going into that employment or that workplace or even just public access training? Uh, some, thing, sing, some things to think through are just like... Say that three times fast. Yeah, right. Some things, I'll keep saying it that way, um, are to like, what do you want your life to look like? What are some common things that in the past work environment would have bothered you and to an accumulation of, you know, potential triggers or discomfort or anxiety or depending on what the service dog is, you know, assisting with. So I'm more or less trying to map out what a day would look like and where I might need some quiet time. Because another thing that might be required is, you know, a cool down period where, uh, you know, a person with a service dog might need to exit the building or go to a, a certain area and just have some like, no one's in here with me and my dog. And I just need some time to kind of recharge for a quick moment. Um, so that might be another consideration if, you can identify, am I a person that might need that? So I should ask my employer if there's somewhere I potentially could go if it's minus 50 outside and I can't go outside. Um, something like that. Uh, i trying to think if I'm missing anything. Like today, I wouldn't want to be, uh, I wouldn't want to be outside today. Yeah. So something as simple as that, uh, as far as just mapping out what your day-to-day -day life is going to look like when you do return to work and how that dog's going to fit into it. Like, are you going to bring the dog to the bathroom with you or is it going to stay on a mat and on, under this table? So I might have to do additional training to make sure that it's safe and everyone knows not to go and pet my dog when I leave or, you know, easiest thing to summarize, map it out and then, you know, make a plan. Perfect. Thanks, Derek. My pleasure. I appreciate um, being here. I have a question, John. Yeah, go for it, Trace. Hey, Derek, it's Tracy. Hi. For the tail end. Hey, nice to see you. Um, what What would you say are, 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 are some things that we could do just in general, people could do in general to support an increase in the tolerance for service dogs to be in workplaces or therapy dogs to be in workplaces or in, in public in general? 
what could the regular person tangibly do to be more welcoming to service teams? I, I think of? I think that's what I'm asking. Basically, because like for 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 example, for listen to disc community arts organization, we do a lot of work with informing about disability culture, so people can understand disability from a different lens than the medicalized lens. And so, you know, myself, you know, I have a service dog in training and I'm, I'm constantly like from the day I met you and sat down with you to now I'm constantly learning things that I didn't consider prior as a, as a handler. But I'm also aware that, um, you know, there are a lot of people that don't understand too much except, oh, that person's lucky to be able to bring their dog with them or, oh, that dog's a hero uh, because that poor person depends on something in a way that most others don't have to. So I just wonder if there's just some general things you think about as a trainer, as a service dog trainer, that we could as humans just be informing others of casually while we're in conversation about disability and or um, service dogs. I think it just starts with a discussion, you know, whether you're um, sharing this recording at some point or you're speaking with a friend about, you know, something that you had discovered. Uh, it's just somewhat trying to get more awareness out in the public eye of some of this information that to me, sometimes I forget is like second nature that other people are like, what? I didn't realize that. Like, sometimes I forget, I get questions like, can I have a therapy dog that I take my dog everywhere? And I'm like, well, that's not a therapy dog. But I forget that sometimes people don't know these, these designations and distinctions. I think the other part is just being free and open to consider, um, you know, that this dog is really assisting this person and to just try to kind of put yourself in that position to be accommodating. Uh, I mean, I'm saying this from a standpoint of, knowing some clients who, and, and just other people who have reached out to me that have had some struggles integrating into the workforce with their service animal and their service dog. But I feel, and I'm, this isn't like technically fact, but I feel like it, there's reservations from company standpoints uh, because there's just fear of the unknown. They're like, Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Like, is this dog going to totally like, and then it just as fear does, it goes down 10 different paths and then nothing gets done. And it's like, ah, we can't, sorry, we can't do this. And it's kind of like, well, we can find a way. Um, so some of it is just trying to reinforce to, um, you know, businesses. Cause a lot of businesses I found in Saskatchewan don't have any protocols for accommodating service animals or service yeah. dogs. So then like, when you go to them, like I want to, you know, come back to work or I want to integrate and et cetera. They're like, well, I don't, what do we do? You can't have a dog here. And it's like, okay, well we have to like, I mean, there, there's just, I think, a, sometimes a lack of information in general. Um, but I think if, as far as just um, being accepting and, and, and recognizing that, you know what, if this dog really facilitates this person to live more of the life that they need and want or used to have, I mean, I'm going to do whatever I can to make that uh, happen. And I think once people kind of put themselves in their, that position and being like, you know what, like, what if that was me? Like, would I be thinking about in this in the same capacity of like, oh, my fear of the unknown, I'm not really sure. And it's just a reframe that I think totally changes from like, oh my, I, we, I don't know how we can accommodate that. Ah, it's just not going to work to, oh, how can we accommodate that? Because you know what, if I was in this position, I would just want this, this type of treatment too. So I can just live my life like everyone else is. If, that makes sense. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead, Priscilla. Yeah. And so last if, question and then we'll uh, okay. end the session. If an uh, employer refuses a certain employee to uh, come into a certain, like there are different rooms, right? So if the employer refuses um, an employee to bring her, his or her service dog into the lunch room, for example, or a certain meeting room, um, just because somebody else has an allergy or, or whatever, because the dog sheds too much or whatever, uh, can can the business get into trouble? Will the employer get into trouble or will this become a HR issue? Uh, can this escalate or usually uh, people with service dogs, are they more understanding? Are they like, okay, we keep our service dog back at our desk or 
does this usually become a problem? It varies drastically from situation to situation, circumstance to circumstance. All I can tell you is that if and when those types of things come up, the number one place to get uh, assistance with or understanding or clarification is Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission. They're okay. the people you talk to with those kinds of questions or when you're hitting hurdles or, or difficulties. Uh, I don't have an answer for that because it's just not my expertise. Okay. Can I, can I add one thing to that, uh, Derek? Not that it is my expertise, but one of the things I found, and this is largely from experience with other um, accessibility requirements, but I found it rings equally true with the service animal, is the more you know about what is required, the more comfortable you you tend to be able to make these places. And mm. that the, the ones where I have caught real trouble is where it's a big corporate structure that if they do have protocols, they are based on Alberta or BC places where um, the certifications are more formal. Um, but it's things like, like in any uh, access situation, um, I think, uh, and Derek, I think you spoke about this earlier, you know, knowing your rights, but also, you know, we keep, we still keep the letter from, from you that says the dog is, is trained by you. And, you know, here's the phone number and here's what it's trained to task to do. Um, because that's the closest to protection that we can get with the state of legislation in this province and indeed across Canada. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add just in general before we go? Um, anything, uh, you know, um, you know, about maybe about no dog left behind or service dogs in general? Um, not really just to continue to tune in. We'll have another call in a few weeks. Um, content will be posted about that soon. And if you want to find anything more about myself or uh, my business, you're free to visit um, ndlb.ca. Uh, there's lots of information on there and there's also um, a service uh, so it's Saskatchewan policy on service animals, like a uh, link in there you can get and a guide and so forth um, to kind of reinforce stuff that we talked about last call. If you were, if you missed that one. Yeah. And when uh, just, sorry, just because we ran out of time, if you have any feedback for this session, um, please send it to us. You can send it to us via our Facebook page, listen to this community arts, or you can also email us, uh, listen to this. Uh, uh, with a D at uh, sastel.net. And in fact, just before we go, I'll uh, just type that into the chat. Uh. Hey, hey, John, can I add something in closing? Of course, yeah. Um, Derek, it's Tracy again. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I got to only catch a very little bit, but um, I, I, get to, I can watch the, the recording. Um, for everybody that's here with us today, thank you. And um, if there was, if there are things that you are genuinely and generally enjoying about this session or the one before, so things that you like, or anything that you would like more of or added to, if you share that with us, uh, Derek and I um, can converse about this and make sure to bring some of those things forward for you and with you. And we're also planning. Um, uh, informally, but still planning to continue something like this with Derek to continue to inform the province of Saskatchewan about the need for service dogs being um, within our environments and um, also therapy dogs. So please don't hesitate. No question is um, a bad question and no feedback is bad feedback. It's all really good and really welcomed and it will help us formulate the next sessions um, in the future or, or sessions for the future. All right, thanks. Thank you everyone. And before we go, I just want to, I know I've said that about three times, but uh, yeah, the next session is February 9th at two, uh, let me shift, but we'll, we'll, you'll see it on our Facebook page and website. Um, and also just wanna thank our interpreters from SAS Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services. We're really thankful to be able to provide, that they provide services for our programming. Um, and we are thankful for the support that they're able to provide. Thank you everyone uh, and have a good rest of your day.